Number 10, the Meatly. The Meatly is a character that appears in the game whose design is based off of the Meatly Game Limited's mascot and logo. He can be found in the small secret room and kind of looks like a stick figure. Well, a stick figure if he had more meat on his bones. The Meatly has a rectangular body, which is usually depicted as being red, but due to the game's coloring, he instead appears here as beige and black, like everything else in the Bendy and the Ink Machine world. You can spot Meatly if you know when and where to look in chapter 1, 2, 3, and 4 of the game. In chapter 2, Meatly appears with a tuba and a music stand, whereas in chapter 1, he is standing just behind a little lit candle which sits on the floor. In chapter 3, he appears behind a table which has a tea set and what looks like lunch set up on it. In chapter 4, Meatly is found mid barbecue. Number 9, Through the Mirror. Susie Campbell, the original voice actress employed by Joey Drew Studios to voice Alice Angel at the studio, refers in the first voice recording you find of hers to how much fun she has voicing Alice. It may only be my second month working for Joey Drew, she says with excitement in her voice, but I can already tell I'm going to love it here. People really seem to love my Alice Angel voice. Sammy says she may be as popular as Bendy someday. These past few weeks, I have voiced everything from talking chairs to dancing chickens, but this is the first character I have really felt a connection with, like she's a part of me. Alice and I, we're going places. Well, Susie doesn't get to continue voicing Alice, whose popularity is later called into question as a character, her reference to voicing talking chairs could be a reference to a famous old Disney cartoon called Through the Mirror, where Mickey's astral self or his dream self seems to leave his body after he falls asleep reading through the looking glass, and moves through his own mirror to a world almost identical identical to his own, but where all of his objects and his furniture are seemingly alive. Which honestly sounds terrifying. <laughs> and friends, before we move on to this next spot, if you are loving this list and you want more like it, more Bendy and the Ink Machine lists, be sure to let us know by giving this video a thumbs up. Just call me life's biggest questions because we're getting philosophical today. Bendy and the Ink Machine is a first person puzzle action horror game that begins in the far days past of animation and ends in a very dark future. You play as Henry as he revisits the demons of his past by exploring the abandoned animators workshop of Joey Drew Studios. With twists and turns at every corner, solve the riddle, escape the workshop, and above all, fear the machine and survive. But what if this machine and this game was real? That's what we're exploring today. Greetings gamers and welcome back to Top 10 Gaming. I'm Connor Monroe and this is what if Bendy and the Ink Machine was real? Let's do it. To answer this question, we first need to ask a question. What is the Ink Machine? The Ink Machine was installed by the cartoon studio's owner Joey Drew and the Ghent Company to create living entities for the animation company. Wally Franks was the only person allowed to be the attendant to this machine. It's also the main plot device that's triggering many of the events because of the ink that flows through the machine. Basically, it's a giant machine that uses ink and human souls to make living versions of the Joey Drew Studios characters. But it didn't actually start out like this. Originally, the ink machine functioned like a 3D printer of sorts, where sketches would turn into real three-dimensional models and figures. However, somehow the machine gets enchanted or corrupted in some way, and changes to allow these cartoons to create living versions. These characters also have multiple variations, with some characters being made out of only ink, and others being infused with human souls. When infused with the soul, however, the ink machine may get a paper jam in a sense. Basically, those pure of heart, or those that have a genuine love for the characters, would turn into the perfect version of the character they most relate to, while those with impure intentions or any corrupt individuals would turn into evil versions of those characters. Number 8, Mysterious Radio. In chapter 1, as you set out to explore what appears to be the abandoned and semi-boarded up studio, there is a secret room that you can find and explore if you happen to find the hint as to which one it is. Said hint can be seen if you are looking near the bottom of the doors in the hallway, where you will see a light shining through the gap underneath, beneath where the door ends and the floor begins. This door with the light underneath can then be opened. Inside this secret room, you will find a radio that, if you turn it on, will play an eerie yet upbeat song. The real question is though, who turned on and off that light? Also, where is that light in the room? Do you even see it? 
I can't remember. Basically, the ink machine acted as your partner's father that you're meeting for the first time, asking you what your intentions are, then judging you based on your answer. The evil versions of these characters, like Bendy and Alice Angel, turned into the antagonists of the game, though, whereas the perfect versions, like Mecha Boris and Perfect Alice, turned into our allies, even if they were made completely out of ink. Now, without getting too deep into the story or lore of the games, what if this machine was real? How much damage would it cause? Unfortunately, there would probably be a lot of human sacrifice in this story, just because, well, that's kind of how these things go. The character would probably end up having a human soul. There would also need to be someone who was actively sacrificing these people to the machine, either in an effort to make an army or to promote their characters even more. And you know exactly who I'm thinking would do that? <laughs> oh hell yeah, it's Disney. Disney is just the kind of company that would sacrifice humans to an ink machine in an effort to promote or market themselves even more. The idea that they could fill their parks with actual living versions of their characters would be impossible for them to pass up. And honestly, I'd see why. Being the first place to have real versions of cartoon characters so many people grew up with would solidify their growing monopoly, and would in essence make them the world's biggest superpower more than they already are. Nobody would be talking about Jeff Bezos and his freaking Dr. Evil style rocket, or the guy that paid $28 million to be on said rocket and then called in saying that he was busy that day. Like, nobody would care. We would be in awe of Disney and their real characters. As a kid, we think the characters we meet when we go to the parks are the real ones, but as we grow older, we grow out of that illusion. But this would suck even adults back to meet the real characters. People who as kids grew up watching Peter Pan meet the real flying Peter Pan and Tinkerbell. <laughs> Tinkerbell. <laughs> Anyway, the ability to create these characters in real life is something that Disney would not pass up. The question is, how would they get the souls? They could just force the characters who already wear the suits into the machine, but this could result in evil versions of the characters, like an evil melting Cinderella, and that wouldn't be good for kids. Number 7, Cock of the Walk. Another reference that may be intended by Susie Campbell's description of her work around and before voicing Alice Angel is the Silly Symphony is Disney animated short from 1935 called Cock of the Walk. In this Disney cartoon, a dashing and strong boxing champion rooster who is successful returns home to the roost. This rooster gets the attention of a hen who is in the midst of being courted already when he returns. He steals her attention away from the rooster who was courting her initially, resulting in a fight between the two for her affections. The animated short also features a lot, and I mean a lot of dancing chickens. So the best bet would probably be to have some form of a job opening where you'd apply and then be given a questionnaire to fill out followed by an interview, same with any other job, except instead they're turning you into a cartoon character instead of destroying your dreams. Well, I mean, I guess maybe it would be the same thing. Now, not everyone would obviously make the cut, but the issue still remains. What about the bad apples? Obviously, everyone is on their best behavior during an interview and even the first days or months of a job. So how can we tell the good nuts from those who would try to catch a squirrel from a chocolate factory? Well, time. If Disney wanted to minimize their chances of making an evil clone, at least if they knew about it, they would wait to see an employee's true colors before putting them through the machine. But then again, this is if they knew about the potential imperfections and if they knew what caused them, which is a big if, since we only have an idea about what causes it thanks to Matt Pat and his theories on the games, as well as Super Horror Bro. If it was real, Matt Pat wouldn't have made a theory about the games because they wouldn't exist, and neither would Super Horror Bro. So they wouldn't really know about the defects until they saw one. So if they didn't know and just started throwing their employees into the machine, how would they deal with the rejects? This is a moral dilemma and I honestly don't know how Disney would handle it. The simple solution is just to put a bullet between their eyes, but if that got out, Disney would have to deal with a lot more than just getting cancelled. Plus, I don't know if they'd want to spend the money on the bullets. They absolutely would not let these versions run around the park terrorizing the kids, but maybe they'd keep them around for Halloween Horror Nights. Does Disney do that or is it just Universal? 
Islands or Six Flags or whatever. Like, this is why Canada is great because we have Wonderland and that's basically it. I don't count Cedar Park, but if you know, you know. But even if they did let them out during Halloween only, we see Imperfect Alice and even Sammy actively try and kill us. So we have no idea what unhappy, imperfect Disney characters would do during Halloween where everyone thinks that people are just having fun or putting on a show. You'd see Captain Hook stab someone in the eye and they'd all think that it's a, just a show. Unless they figured out that these characters were homicidal maniacs beforehand, they would have one bloody night and then get shut down for the rest of forever. The question is would they be liable for any lives taken or damages? It depends. If the court could prove that the ink machine was willingly used by Disney to create those monsters and then unleashed, then yes, they probably would be. But to prove that, the court would either need a willing subject to go through the machine, or they would have to try and make a pure ink monster which could yield poor results, creating a searcher or even nothing. But a searcher could be enough to convince a jury. Then again, they could could also just kill all the imperfect versions of the characters just because they weren't exactly what they wanted. And I mean, it's not like you can identify a cartoon character as a human, right? Maybe? I don't know, do they keep their fingerprints? Their dental records? I don't know. But digging up the body of an imperfect Ariel after the company announced that they were going to have real versions of their characters at their park would be a real PR disaster. And would probably come with a full blown investigation that would reveal what the hell they were doing and then boom. Actually this is kind of funny since the financial mistake that probably ruined Joey Drew Studios was probably Bendy Land, which I'm sure would have featured real life versions of their most popular characters, and that might have been why he was testing the ink machine. But there we have it friends, what if Bendy and the ink machine was real? We would probably have a Disney nightmare on our hands that would shut down the company forever, much like Joey Drew Studios. And yes, I know that Joey Drew Studios was meant to represent Max Fleischer and not Walt Disney, but if this technology was real in our time, we know that Disney would have capitalized on it first, or at least have wiped out Fleischer's name from the records of having used it or invented it much like he did with Steamboat Willie. Number 6, Bendy Jump Scare. In chapter 1, Moving Pictures, while attempting to get the ink machine turned back on, you can find a little Bendy Jump Scare, if you know where to look. And if you don't, don't worry, because I'm going to tell you about where you can find that. Bendy is hiding behind the door to the left of the first Wally Franks' audio recording. So if you go to open that door, he'll be there and ready to jump scare you. Or at least one of his cardboard cutouts will be, which to me is pretty scary. I don't like when those cardboard cutouts just seem to move of their own accord, especially as they have a tendency to mysteriously vanish afterwards, like after you go to chase them. It's like mannequins coming to life at night, but then you only happen to catch them moving out of the corner of your eye. Ugh, it's all creepy stuff. Number five, Minor Search Your Boss, or Search Your Minor Boss? However we want to say this. In chapter 2 there is a hidden secret boss. In order to find it you must go all the way back to the beginning to the room where you spawned with the pentagram on the floor. There you'll find a boss that is in the form of a minor searcher. This boss with their trusty little mining hat can be killed with 3 to 4 hits from your axe. Alternatively you can lead it back to the room where you squished Jack Fane with his very very stylish hat and squish the miner there also. Either way will work when it comes to defeating it. And it is possible to also unlock a special jump scare through defeating this boss. So if you missed that, you might want to go do it. Number 4, Whistle While You Wait. While heading towards the ritual room in chapter 2, before you get to the jump scare, if you walk backwards toward the ink flooded room until you bump into the door, and then you turn around and face the door and wait a bit, you can hear Bendy whistling while he waits for you. Ugh. It's assumed anyways that the whistling is coming from Bendy. It definitely sounds eerie, yet similar in tone and pitch to Mickey Mouse's famous whistle from the Steamboat Willie cartoon. Though definitely not the same tune, and slower than Mickey's whistling. Still, it's really creepy. Could Bendy and the Ink Machine and FNAF actually be in the same universe? It's a question I've had on my mind recently. I mean, both series have stories we wouldn't believe to be possible in our world, so maybe the laws of both universes are connected. I mean, all we really need to do is find explanations for things from one game and the other, right? I think that's possible. So that's what we're exploring today. Greetings gamers and welcome back to Top 10 Gaming. I'm Connor Monroe and today we ask the question, are Bendy and FNAF in the same universe? Why would they be connected? Well, 
No clue, really. I mean, we just think that it could be possible in theory. Do we think that the creators ever intended to make these games connected? No. But is it fun to speculate? Absolutely yes. This idea started for me when I thought about how souls in some ink monsters allowed them to persist after death, and how the ink machine would go about accomplishing such a task. I mean, we still don't know. Out of the thousands of souls that I've taken, I haven't been able to infuse them into many objects. So, how could this machine do it consistently? The solution seemed to come to me thanks to Five Nights at Freddy's. Agony. For you Bendy fans, if you don't know, possession in the FNAF universe is actually through the emotion of Agony rather than an actual soul, since Agony is the most powerful emotion and reaches further from the body than any other emotion, even anger or sadness. So when a character in the FNAF universe suffers an agonizing death, that pain and suffering is able to allow them to potentially possess an object, an animatronic, or otherwise, even sometimes a person, as we see in one case. Yeah, there's a person who was possessed in the FNAF series. Number three. Bendy's Poses In Chapter 1, Moving Pictures, when you enter the storyboarding studio, you'll notice a drawing of Bendy on the work table. If you leave and re-enter, or just like turn away and then come back, Bendy's pose will actually change. You can try this out multiple times, and each time you re-enter, the Bendy's pose will be different. Poses include Bendy lying down, reclining, jumping for joy, falling, sitting contently, and even one where he holds his hands up to his mouth, his eyes wide with either terror or remorse. Not sure which, but either way, it's pretty freaky. So if this ink machine is able to infuse these characters with souls, maybe instead the machine is killing these sacrifices and using their agony to grab hold of the character that the machine creates. It explains why a few characters who have a soul are mostly evil. I mean, they've suffered tremendous pain. And while evil Alice says that she went through the machine multiple times, she could be lying. She's evil. Or the agony attached onto that specific section of ink, thus letting it go through the machine again and again. Instead of the whole, a drop of water in the ocean is rarely seen again mentality that we see come from good Alice. But that's not really enough evidence to definitively say that Bendy and FNAF are the same universe, right? I mean, it's not even evidence, it's just potential. Is there anything else that gives us an explanation in another game? Or vice versa? Actually, it could explain how William Afton plans to escape the virtual world in Security Breach. Now, we know that William is trying to escape the FNAF VR game we test, known as Freddy Fazbear's Virtual Experience, and this is because while he may be able to control certain individuals, like Van for instance, he cannot control them completely as we see in the FNAF AR emails, so he wants to get out and get back to his world. How could he do this? Well, how about with equipment similar to the ink machine? While yes, it wouldn't really be the ink machine itself, a machine that is capable of infusing something with a soul or agony like we see the ink machine do could very well be what allows William to move from the virtual world back into a robotic endoskeleton or something similar like we see in the last seconds of the security breach trailer. Since converting sentient computer code into a living AI, in a sense, is certainly easier said than done. I mean, this isn't Doki Doki Literature Club, right? So what machine could this be? It's honestly hard to tell. It could be anything. Number 2. Alice Angel Alice Angel seems to exist as a reference to another famous and controversial cartoon character, Betty Boop, who also provided a similar counterbalance to their cartoon co-star. Betty Boop has a kind of weird origins in terms of her character design. Originally she had like little poodle ears. It was a weird thing. She was made to be a counterbalance to the talking cartoon dog, Bimbo. And the two were also kind of shipped together. Another reference to Alice Angel and Bendy's relationship as the two were also speculated to be dating. Betty Boop herself was a flapper and a singer and dancer like Alice Angel, whose voice and appearance were inspired by Helen Kane. But later on, when Helen Kane tried to sue Fleischer Studios for using her likeness without paying her or, you know, getting permission, it was insinuated in court that Helen Kane herself had stolen when it came to her sound and vocal stylings, being an impression of a young performer known as Baby Esther. Helen Kane did not win the case against Fleischer in the end, which was dismissed due to insufficient evidence to back up her claim. Number 1. Bendy the Devil Bendy seems to have been inspired by a few different characters, one obviously being Bimbo, Betty Boop's partner, but a major inspiration seemingly being the original Mickey Mouse. The name Bendy even has a similar ring to it, Mickey, Bendy, you know what I mean? Initially Bendy's glove design was even virtually identical to Mickey's, sporting three darts on the back of the the hands, but they were later changed to feature two round dots instead, likely to avoid appearing too similar. 
You always want to be careful with things like that with Disney. I feel like that's a good idea. Bendy also seems to take inspiration from another classic cartoon character, Felix the Cat, with his head shape and overall facial design and coloring appearing pretty similar to Felix's. Kind of creepy to think how many classic and in some cases family friendly cartoon characters Bendy was based off of. However, it could be made using similar or scrapped parts from the ink machine, or gone through whatever process caused the ink machine to get haunted or whatever it had to go through to gain its powers in the Bendy games. And they could be from the same manufacturer, or they could just honestly, it could just be the ink machine itself. Now, do I think it's going to be the ink machine? Absolutely not. It would just be another machine that we have that would link to the ink machine in some way, but I don't think it's entirely out of the question. I mean, it's definitely not going to be intentional, but hey, it's fun anyway. Bendy and the Ink Machine started in 2017, which is three whole years after FNAF released its first game, and is the year after Sister Location came out. Plus, later that year we got Pizzeria Simulator, which could have some subtle references to Bendy and the Ink Machine that we just aren't aware of. So while it's still unlikely that we end up getting a solid, confirmed canon link between these games, it's still fun to speculate and provide answers for questions using the laws of another universe. But I guess at this point, it's not another universe at all, right?